Okay. <coughs> Welcome, everybody. I'm very happy to see you all back. It's the hardest slot of the conference, I would say. Right after lunch on the last day, on a Friday in Santa Barbara. So I'm really happy that everybody could make it back to the panel discussion. My name is Axel Poschmann, and I'm going to host this session for the next 60 minutes. When I'm not moderating panels, I'm actually leading the security concepts teams at NXP. And when I discuss with Benedict, my co-chair, uh, about the necessity of a panel versus a second invited talk, we very quickly concluded that we will go for panel discussion. And the reason is that we believe that the changes in the next 10 years and the challenges ahead are so profound and so diverse that a single person will have a hard time to address them all. So that's why we assembled a panel of four very different persons with different views, so we hope. Um, so we get different views on all the challenges that are ahead. One example, what we believe is um, a very important paradigm shift is offline versus online or isolated versus complex systems. For example, if you look at this payment device, it was engineered for this purpose, standalone, offline, and secure, I would say. And then you look at the modern online payment device that has so many more features and uh, a huge additional attack vector. It's also very usable. So there are opportunities and threats to this paradigm shift. The threats are that the attack surface is really, really much bigger, while at the same time the opportunity is that you can also mitigate the risk by online updates or anomaly detection or these kind of things. And finally, um, if data is really the new oil, then privacy is the new green. That's a, a very good quote, I think, because if we collect all these data and make use of it to enable new use cases, then there's a risk and a threat to privacy. Same holds true if you want to do an identified fraud, then we need data that could also potentially violate privacy. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. I start in alphabetic order. First on, on the panel is uh, Gemma Calden clavel She's a director and founding partner at Ethicas Consulting and Research. Um, she's also a researcher at University of Barcelona in Spain in the sociology department. She uh, used to work uh, in different places. One I'd like to highlight is the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. She holds a PhD on surveillance, security, and urban policing. And in her role as a policy analyst in Ethicas, she's working on surveillance, social, legal, and ethical impacts of technology. Yeah. Should I go for my yeah. few minutes? OK, so I'm the social scientist in the room. Um, and I hope that more people like us are going to start coming to these conferences. Um, but just for the sake of waking you up a little bit, I think that I'm here, and I think that people like me from the social sciences are becoming more and more relevant to what you do because you screwed up. <laughs> we left you to your own devices, engineers, mathematicians working on technology, IT experts. We trusted you with our digital futures, with the future of technology, and you promised us a great new world where technology was going to make the world a better place. And what we have is a world riddled by security um, breaches, but also by algorithmic discrimination that sometimes worsens some of the, divide, the divides that we're already concerned about. We have a world where privacy is eroded. We have a world where some of the devices that are being produced do help us lead better, happier lives, but we also see a lot of junk, a lot of devices that solve no real life actually existing problems, but create new problems. A world of data breaches, as I, um, as I mentioned, so there's things about the promise that don't really stand. Um, and you here are very aware of that because you work on those security issues. So there's one part of this dark other side of technology that you are very familiar with. You realize that some of the promises of these technologies don't hold because security is an issue. 
But while focusing on security, sometimes you forget that issues like privacy and data protection or some of the ethical debates that we need to have around whether technology is even desirable. Should we build some of the things that we are building? What futures are we creating for our sons and daughters? Do we want to be part of that? How do you build your own values into the technology that you are contributing to construct? These are the things that you should be thinking about. And at the same time, we should be understanding better how to build our concerns into what you do. So we need to talk more. And that's why I'm here, and that's why I hope you get more people to talk to over the years and in your different um, environments. So if you ask me what the, ch the, the challenges for the next 10 years are, I think that there's one that stands out, which is the need to create socio-technical architectures for technology. We need to make sure that whatever we build has at heart not only the latest in terms of technological capabilities, but also the latest in terms of our ability to understand the world around us. We need technologies that understand the needs and the rights of the, of the users, technologies that listen to users. Um, and not only because we want to do good, but also because not listening to users can lead to reputational and financial losses. So if that's what it's going to take for you to be convinced that you need to look at that, then pay attention to the privacy disasters that keep happening. Every time there's a security disaster, a security a data breach, that goes hand in hand with a privacy breach um, as well. We need to build technology that is accountable. Technology needs to be able to be audited. Uh, we need to open the black box of algorithms. If we want to develop technology for the people, the people need to know what's inside of that technology. We need to predict the world that may emerge because of the technologies that we are building. If we are to substitute many jobs with new technology, then what's the future of work? What will our grandchildren work on? Have you ever thought about that? What is the future of sociability, where distance disappears when making friends? What is the future of autonomy? Or the future of growing up in a world that does not allow you to forget? In a world where memory is compulsory because every single thing you've done in your life has been tweeted, recorded, or stored by someone somewhere. What will growing up mean in this new world that we're all contributing to, to create? So ultimately, I think that we need that social analysis finds it, its way into the technical specifications that you are designing. But you also need to find more allies in people like us to reach community organizations, policy um, agents, government, but also corporations to make sure that we address security risks, adding this other layer, which is not just about security, it's also about how technology contributes to building new worlds. I'm gonna leave it here because I only had three minutes and I hope that's enough for you to get you to, to be interested in what the panel could bring about. Thanks, Gemma. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is I will introduce each and every panelist individually. They have their opening statements. Then afterwards, we'll discuss a bit, and then we open the floor for questions. Uh, next on the list is Alex Gampman. He's a vice president of engineering at Qualcomm. He holds a master's degree in cryptography and network security from UC San Diego. And his current role he is, um, involves that he oversees product security support for mobile computing, networking, automotive, healthcare, smart home, wearables, and IoT. Thanks, Axel. So um, that was quite an act to follow. <laughs> I think my statement does a lot more prosaic, but still probably quite a bit depressing because I'm assuming none of you came to a security conference for a dose of optimism. So, uh, so when, when um, Axel uh, asked, uh, you know, invited me to the panel and I uh, thought about the next 10 years, I, I first thought about the previous 10 years. So. Um, how many of you were at Chess in 2006? All right. Do you remember any papers from Chess 2006? All right. Um, there were no hands, I think. So 2006, just to set the stage, so this is um, more than a year before the first iPhone is announced. This is two years before the first Android phone comes out. So that's how far back that is. That's how much changes in 10 years. So. Uh, I'm a little bit skeptical about our ability to accurately predict what's going to come in the next 10 years. Uh, 
but also, so how many of you worked in the, were already working in the field 10 years ago? All right, thanks. And um, so how many of you, so the problems that you were working on 10 years ago, how many of you have solved them, the solutions have been deployed, you know, it, it, the world sort of got it, you moved on to the next challenge. <laughs> Paul, Paul, Paul is half raising his hand. Okay, all right. Okay, how, how many of you have realized it was a it, it was an idea before its time, um, and uh, you know the world wasn't ready. You decided to move on to something else. Okay, one or two hands. And how many of you are still working on the, more or less the same challenges? Okay, a lot more hands. All right. So, so that gives you some indication as to what you can look forward to for the next ten years. Um, and I think I think part of the reason that is the case is. <laughs> Um, a lot of, um, I think a lot of the challenges that we're attempting to solve, um, their real roots are not in the technical essence of the problem, right? And the solution is not going to be purely technical. And I think as a community, we like to come up with new, you know, more and more technical approaches, uh, but it's not ultimately the t a lot of times the technical solution that really solves it. And we have to be cognizant of, um, you know, the social factors, the business factors, um, that impact the problem and understand how the technical solution fits within that context. Um, uh, I think that's, oh, I guess, I don't know, I, did I, are you not depressed enough? You wanna, <laughs> one more? Okay, one more, since I, I'm looking at Paul. So, so <laughs> Paul, 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 so Paul Kocher's, I think, original um, differential analysis research is now 20 years old, right? 96, I think was the first paper. Um, uh, you know, stack smashing for fund and profit, also 96, almost, also just passed its 20 year anniversary. So 20 years ago, we discovered, you know, side channel attacks and memory corruption through buffer overflow. And we're basically no really much closer to addressing either of those. I mean, so solutions exist as far as um, actual uh, elimination of the problem in deployed products. Uh, anyway. Okay, thanks for the <laughs> uplifting words. <laughs> so, then uh, next on the list uh, of the panelists is uh, Daniel Perito. He's a senior software engineer at Square in San Francisco. Uh, there he leads the security and anti-fraud team on Square Cash. He was a postdoc at UC Berkeley where he uh, researched, um, among other things, on machine learning and security. And he holds a PhD from Inria Rhone Alps, that's in France, on software based attestation of embedded devices. All right. So, when I was invited to this uh, panel, I thought that it was going to be very uh, focused on hardware security. And uh, I haven't been touching that subject for a long time, and so I, I felt I was going to be out of water. But Axel assured me that, you know, different perspectives were welcome, and uh, in the past few years, I've been working on uh, product security and making sure that, how do you design a product that is secure, and um, how do you make sure that people cannot get in, and how do you make sure that uh, there is no fraud in the system, you know, Square is a financial company, so these things are very important to us. So I think I have a perspective from a addition security uh, field and security area uh, that can perhaps be useful to this panel. So just as a incep in few inception points that I think are worthwhile discussing about what's gonna be important in the next 10 years, I think that there are a few like high level teams that I, I sort of like saw. Um, and um, so first of all, the amount of code that is getting online is staggering. So every year there is more code written by more people that is getting connected to the you know, to the, to, the, to the internet, basically. And I think, you know, everybody knows and in, has internalized that uh, defenses and attacks are asymmetrical. You know, you only need to attack one point and you have to defend every point. But I think with the amount of people that are writing code and the amount of code that is being written, there is another part, another point that is very important, which is, by definition, the engineers that are writing code are average, you know. And you need to attack the least common denominator of these vast amount of people that are writing code. So, and the least not common, the, the more things are written and the more people are writing code, the lowest, the least common denominator you expect there to be because, you know, that's how these things work. And on the other hand, attackers are very talented and very knowledgeable in what they do. And so, like the top 1% of the attackers are attacking the bottom 10% of, 
of software engineers, in a sense. So, and this only gets worse as more code gets committed. So, so to me, like, as a type of solution that I will encourage, and I would like to discuss about this, is the fact that, you know, safety by default framework and languages and libraries are the way to go. Like, it needs to be as simple as possible to make things secure. And so, and there is this one thing I wanted to discuss. And the other thing about, that I wanted to bring about is the fact that, you know, historically, I think the biggest motivators for attackers have been either intelligence or financial gain. And with some of our, you know, Internet of Things and cars attacks, we've seen more attacks that are potentially motivated by mayhem. You know, well, you know, the thing is, okay, what will happen if somebody hijacks that, hijacks that car, steers them, you know, and kills somebody? I fundamentally think that these attacks are less likely because, you know, financial motivation is a much, much uh, more enticing incentive that people pursue, and then intelligence is also something that people pursue because nation states are interested in this. Mayhem is less, in, 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 you know, there is less likelihood. It's, it's going to happen for sure, but just less likely. I think what that means for us is that attack research has a much higher likelihood of finding vulnerabilities before they're actually exploited in the wild. Because if, if attacks that pursue mayhem are less likely, it means that you know, it's much more likely that, that like a white hat researcher or like an academia researcher can find this vulnerability and make the world safer. So attack research, I think, is going to be very important as well. So OK, thanks. So um, the, the fourth panelist is um, David Oots. He's CEO and president of Trillium, an uh, automotive startup company based in Japan. He has more than 25 years of experience in the high-tech arena and senior executive positions. And previous stints include Freescale, AMD, Dell, amongst many others. And before that, he worked on management consulting at Deloitte and Touche. And um, he believes the future of cybersecurity is software-based for embedded devices. <coughs> Hi. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm here from Japan. Uh, I'm with a company called Trillium. And we entered the market in cybersecurity with a solution for encrypting and authenticating on classic CAN. Um, so most of what I'll talk about is about automotive or transportation systems. Um, and what, what are the security challenges that we're going to see over the next 10 years? First and foremost, who's going to pay for the cybersecurity? Automotive makers don't want to pay for it. Tier one makers don't want to pay for it. Governments aren't going to pay for it. So cybersecurity is not free. Who's going to pay? Uh, who's going to own the responsibility in the case of a breach that turns fatal? Um, how much regulation is going to be required in order to get the uh, security deployed in vehicles? Um, key management, the who, what, where, when, why, and how much of key management and how that's going to be managed by the industry. And then the trade-offs between hardware and software-based cybersecurity and the fact that um, a vehicle, an, a consumer vehicle has a 20-year life, expe life expectancy and a commercial vehicle has a 35-year life expect expectancy. If you're plugging in chips to solve the problems, you're plugging in problems that can be reverse engineered and brought to bear on those systems over time. So I think those would be the major challenges that we see, at least in the transportation industry for cyber going forward. Thank you. OK, thanks. So now I'd like to encourage the panelists to, uh, I guess you, you took notes and have comments on other statements. Maybe we can pick on one of your um, statements. Who's going to pay for cybersecurity? And I would be interested to see the policists' point of view. Where should the incentive be put? Do we need regulation, law? What is efficient? How do we get there? Are there metrics to measure the impact? These kind of things. Maybe you can start and then you guys can jump in. Sure. Um, there's a lot to say about, about this, and let me maybe start with something a bit more general. There's a lot of people saying that one of the problems that we have is that technology moves a lot faster than the law, and so we don't have the necessary legal tools to address the challenges that technology is posing. That's a lie. We have all the laws that we need. What we lack oftentimes is the political decision um, and drive to use them and mobilize them. And we also lack judges and lawyers that understand the nature of the laws and not just the letters of the law. Sure, we will not find a law that addresses smart cars, for instance, but we do find laws that talk about what are the rights that need to be preserved when you're on the road, 
um, laws that define privacy, laws that define lots of little things that intervene in this. So we, we just need to mobilize existing frameworks. So we do have those frameworks. That's, that's something that needs to be um, very, very clear. And then on the basis of this, we can provide answers. But I would throw the question back at um, you and say, what is the problem we are trying to solve with automated cars? If you give us the problem, we can start looking at whether the solution is adequate and how we need to regulate around that. But we haven't found anyone in the, in the industry that is able to identify the problem. Because identifying the problem will determine what solutions we get. So for, um, for smart cars, for um, automated cars, if the problem is that we want to avoid casualties on the road, and we are developing these cars because we want less people to die on the road, that would be one uh, problem to solve, then the ultimate goal of these new cars would be to save lives. And we would regulate around them on the basis of this. So the most lives you save, the more you contribute to the common good and to the goal that you, that you have. And then regulation has to follow this. If the problem is pollution, you want less, we want to reduce pollution, then we would have to promote collective vehicles, for instance, not so much um, individual vehicles, and more effective routes. And then on the basis of this, we can provide the regulation. If the issue here is how the um, car industry can make more money, if that is the problem, then the solution is different. You need to make sure that you encourage everyone to change their car and to buy this new technological um, um, discovery or this new, this new tool, this new thing, and then we build regulations around that. But oftentimes the problem for the regulator is to understand what is the problem we are trying to solve. And the industry is often not very clear about this. And the reasoning around technological innovations seems to change depending on the audience you're talking to. So they, they want to convince everyone that this is desirable from a social point of view, and so you mobilize any reasoning um, that will fly with a, with a specific audience, but that's not, that doesn't help us have answers. Uh, so we need specific problems, specific challenges before we can actually respond to that. But we do have the tools. So, so can I jump in? So, <laughs> so, so, so that, that seems like a very, uh, maybe appropriately, but very uh, policy-centric view of, of things, right? I think the problem that the government would want to solve with regulation may have nothing to do with the problem that the business is trying to do with releasing a product, right? So I, I'm not sure it makes sense to sort of to base regulation um, to, to, yeah, based on what the business was trying to do. I mean, I think you kind of, you hit it uh, on the head with your last, uh, uh, hypothesis that the business most likely is just trying to generate revenue, right? Satisfy market need, whatever it is, right? Uh, and if it can do it by decreasing pollution, saving lives, you know, that's great. But that's not what should be driving government policy, right? So, you know, government should have its own position on what's important. And if business sort of goals or business direction is at odds with that, that's when regulation comes in. Should it be the other way around? What do you mean by the other way around? That it, it's, if you, the proof of concept is on the industry in a way. So we have a legal framework and if you wanna create a new tool that you feel um, stretches the limits of that legal framework, then you have to determine how to make your tool legal. True, but that, I think that's a big, if there wasn't apparent to me in the beginning that we're talking about something that is currently considered to be uh, not allowed within the legal framework. I, I, okay, that, I, I didn't realize that that's the kind of case that we're discri discussing. But that often happens. I think I challenge the idea that regulation is sufficient and is already there and the frameworks are already in place. Because I think fundamentally security is a new thing. So let me explain. Uh, say that there are regulations around building safe bridges. And those regulations are quite precise, and, are be, and, and they're precise because it's, you can precisely define what a safe bridge is in terms of engineering, and in terms of forces and things like that. There isn't such a definition for security. So that's, that's a very big, big thing is that, you know, we only have precise definitions for very narrow things about, you know, very narrow protocols and cryptography. But like when, a system is very complex, you just don't know what you're actually defining is. You cannot mandate you shall make your system secure because 
what that is. What does that mean? So I think for things like, you know, vehicle to vehicle communication and things where there is different companies that need to participate to a network, I honestly think that industry self-regulation may be more effective. The reason is because the industry wants to create a platform where it's safe to be in. And that's not unlike what car processing, for example, is, where there are self-regulating standards about security. And security is a very hard thing to measure, as I said, or even to certify against. But I feel like an independent body can keep up with like policies versus the government would have to like keep you know updating the laws or have like an independent agency perhaps. So I think that I can see both models work. I can just feel like one model has a high like to work. I challenge you to convince Taylor Swift when she had her naked pictures stolen from her cloud and said that self regulation is enough. I think that everyone who's been the victim of a security or privacy breach realizes that self-regulation hasn't worked. You're making and the, therefore there's, a, there's maybe a need of some help. You're making the implicit assumption that regulation would have helped. Yes. It would have, it would have, it would have prevented. <laughs> it would have forced you to explain the things that are happening in terms of security in the cloud, for instance. But, but I, I guess right now, users don't even have the access to the information on what's actually happening with their data. So they cannot make an informed decision, just and that think, is a problem. I just think that the problem is of such complexity that it's hard to even state in language what it is that we're talking about. And I just feel like there is that impotence mismatch. And therefore, n it's hard to imagine an amount of regulation that would have prevented somebody's phone to not leak photos. You know, I just don't see it as, no, even with the technical background, and maybe I'm, you're right that the, the, the industry is not doing a good enough job of like, you know, educating the, the people about the dangers of what they're doing and like the limits of the se security of the systems that they use. But at the same time, we have a harder job than say, you know, builders of bridges, because we cannot actually define, it's like a Turing complete problem. It's like this problem that is like, it's got no solution really. So, uh, yeah. I, I think, I mean, uh, to, uh, to add to that, I think, like I, I've been working on security, on the defensive side of security for uh, 15 years now. Um, and I've never ever heard or anybody come to me and say, you know what, we need to add this additional uh, security mechanism because without it, we don't meet the regulatory or compliance or certification standards. I, I've heard the other a lot, right? Like you don't need to do any more like the vulnerability that you're pointing out is clearly not a real vulnerability because we already meet the bar set by this certification or by this regulation, right? So it's more often used as a ceiling, like you don't need to be more secure than this because you've already met certification. But um, I guess the other point is, I think uh, there is something unprecedented in terms of uh, the legal framework and security. And that is, I, I can't think of another example where we expect consumer goods to withstand um, a, a sort of a sustained malicious attack from a well-resourced adversary, right? There's nothing in my house that can survive a five-year-old with scissors, right? <laughs> yet, 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 yet we expect our software uh, to be able to withstand uh, attacks from nation states. And it, it, you know, there's nothing like that that we own, right? Like my car is not baseball bat proof, right? It's <laughs> mm -hmm. a very good analogy. Mm. But I, I um, don't get me wrong, I don't think that regulation has to solve all our problems. I run a business, um, so, and I think that we have a stake in solving some of these problems, and I think there's lots of other business models that can contribute to this, uh, to this debate. One way maybe of changing the game would be to have an insurance company for data, so that every time there's a data breach, that creates liability. So maybe an insurance company for data could change the rules of the game, and you don't need regulation, and I'm just hoping that these kind of spaces emerge that force change, because what we have right now is very difficult to, um, to defend in a way, because what we're finding, you were, you were saying that security often 
acts as this thing that you just need to comply with in, in a book and that's it, you don't care about it anymore. We find the same in data protection. Some people only care about compliance, just make sure we tick all the right boxes. I don't really care about ethics or anything that goes beyond um, a strict understanding of, of data protection. And that is a problem. But we're seeing more and more how because people's data is so much abused, legal systems, systems that are fully legal are being rejected by the users and the users are the clients. And so we get more and more industry calling us saying, can you please help me improve the privacy of my system? Because otherwise I run the risk of a reputational crisis or financial losses because I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to address these issues once the product is completed. We're still working with the early players in this field, but there's, it's more and more of a concern. And certainly those that are doing things right are worried about the impact on users and on clients of the actors that are not dealing with data in a secure and privacy protecting way. I, I think that it's important to understand there's different things at play here. IoT and automotive is very different from the financial world. The incentives there exist for a uh, industry-wide type of solution because it's, it's, it's a money, the business is money. Um, in IoT, the device might be a $5 device or a $2 device, but it might have video capture of your child sleeping in, it, in its crib, um, or your car could being hacked has life-threatening consequences. So it's, it's different about, you know, who, it's not about who's going to pay. At the end, the consumer is always going to pay up for cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is not, gonna, is not optional for IoT devices or automotives going forward. But we, you know, we didn't get seat belts until the government said they had to put them in the cars. We didn't get airbags until the government said they had to put them in the cars. And cybersecurity is going to be largely the same. The government is going to have to put some type of, of um, regulatory structure around cybersecurity. And, and there's already been a bill uh, raised in the Senate last year in 2015, I think July, called the U.S. Spy Car Act. But that's the start of a certain level of regulation that will be hitting cars and with a $5,000 per car fine for not meeting those requirements by a certain uh, start date to be determined, but um, these things are these are really important things to think about, and um, you know if we don't have a if we don't have a, a cyber systems in place that'll allow us to update our solutions that are in the field. I mean, my people buy their watches, their Fitbits, and they wear them for three months and they throw them away. So the cybersecurity wasn't a big issue there. On a phone, your phone has got a two-year life expectancy usually, I think is the average people use a phone, two years. So hardware encryption and hardware cybersecurity can play there. But in a 20-year life cycle or a 35-year life cycle of transportation equipment that has life-threatening consequences, it's not a matter of who pays, it's when. And how fast we can get it in the, in, into the transportation equipment, and elevators and drones and planes and trains and, and trucks and, fa and factory equipment and robots. Um, you know, ubiquitous encryption is going to be a part of the future, and, and messaging that has anything to do with actuation is going to have to have you know, both authentication and encryption built into the solution from the, from the ground up. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think every time there is a network, there is a higher incentive for self-regulation. Because, you know, say vehicle to vehicle, the vehicle in front of me is selling my car, that there is an accident in front that I can still not see, and, let, you know, what happens if they lie to me, and, you know, if they lie, I can crash. So in those circumstances, different parties need to trust each other. So a Ford car needs to trust, needs to trust that the Chrysler car. And I think this is a natural breeding ground for them to understand that they need to like certify each other before they can speak to each other. So while I do agree that you know there is potential for government regulation as well, I also think that things that look like that, where mutually distrusting parties must cooperate, are naturally you know, prone to like self-regulation in a sense as well. But in any, in any technology that deals with data, one of the things that we find is that in the end, your decisions don't, don't only affect your privacy, privacy becomes a collective issue and that's why regulation is needed. So every time you download an app on your phone, it's not just your privacy that you're giving up, but also the privacy of everyone in your, in your phone book, for instance, or all the interactions that you have. Therefore, you're not only making decisions on yourself, so we do need an other body that is bearing in mind the needs of everyone involved in this transaction because they might not be aware of what is happening with that kind of data. Yeah, I think what I was referring to is mostly applicable to security. I don't know that privacy follows the same things because that's sort of like a shared good, like, you know, uh, you know the quality of the air you breathe and things like that. It's sort of like this shared 
good that you know. But I think every time you say security, most times you could say privacy. I think they, they really go hand in hand when we when we work on data intensive technology. That's not all technologies out there, but technologies that deal with, with that deal with data, any security issue is also a privacy issue. Okay, I think this might be a good point, uh, break point for the first time to open up the floor for questions. I have a couple of questions that we could ask and discuss later in case we don't come up with questions. But if you have questions, please come up and make your way to the microphone. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Hi, so I wanted to ask, um, you, you're talking, you're just now making this distinction between security and privacy. And it feels to me like maybe the distinction here is there is security, particularly in a financial system, right? The security is on things that the organization decide, making the security decisions cares about. If that makes, that's a kind of convoluted way of saying it. If I'm a bank, I care a lot about whether or not money gets stolen, okay? If I'm, you also like if I'm a car, if I'm a car manufacturer, I definitely care if my cars, if there's, a, if there's some sort of security or safety problem that kills customers and ruins my reputation. It's maybe a little more removed. When you talk about privacy, about 99% of the time, you're talking about my company, assuming I have a company, is dealing with other people's data and my incentives usually go exactly the opposite to theirs. You know, like, oh, it's easier, it, I make more money if I can sell their data. Right, and at most I might just say, well, I'm not gonna sell it, but I don't really care that much if their privacy is violated. It feels like, and there are probably other places like that, but it seems like there's a real split there between, you know, if the, you know, if I have an incentive to protect something, then it's probably pretty likely that I care about it. Maybe I still don't know how to, how to do it. Maybe there's some other ex, you know, role for regulation or standards groups or something there. But in the other environment where you have, you know, I'm protecting something that I don't really care whether it gets violated. That's a much, you know, that's a place where I think the case for either regulation or some sort of industry standards or something is a lot stronger. And it's just a distinction, maybe it's useful. So. Mm -hmm. But that, that's why we have a problem with incentives. And that's where regulation can play a role. So when you find that the incentives that the, the that self-regulation creates affect people's rights, then you need regulation. So if you find that the incentive that most companies have if, is uh, for them to sell the personal data of their clients because there's no, there's no protection, then you need to step in because something's gone wrong in self-regulation. And that's, that's what, so we need to look at this, exact this chain of incentives and decide as a society, what do we want to see happen? And then intervene at the moments that we can intervene. I can intervene through my company. A government can inter intervene through regulation. Somebody else could intervene through a different, what I, what I said, the, the, the idea of the insurance for data. So there's different ways you can intervene, but we definitely need to make sure that the incentive structure feeds societal goals, that we are contributing to something that is desirable and within the limits of the law. Well, the, I guess the sideline of that, um, in the crypto community, we, we, we're kind of worried that this is gonna come back. This is a, big struggle before about a desire you've in the US the FBI directors talked about this desire to want to put in you know put back doors in encryption you put some sort of special access for the government into encryption um, and this seems like sort of the other side the bad side of this of the same trade-off that the you know when you say okay well we don't we want to kind of control some of this technology it's getting a little you know it's it's you know, to make sure it uh, matches social goals, there's a downside, which is the people making the decisions about how to control it, they may not have your interests at heart either. You know, I mean, it, it, you're probably actually less destructive to have NSA have all your personal data than like ad companies, but it's, you might not actually want to give either one. You know? <laughs> Definitely, but I think that in, in the fight for- Dep Depending on what color your passport is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> very likely. For encryption, I think we, we're fighting the same fight. And that's a good thing, that's why I mentioned the, the need to build bridges and to find new allies because we can really benefit from having you on board and I think you can really benefit from having us on board because we are really fighting the same fight. Encryption should be by default. Yeah. But I think just to add to one more uh, point to the regulation comment, I think um, as, as David mentioned, right, so we have the safety regulation with seat belts and airbags, but in those cases, the outcome was clearly measurable, right? You know, the, the, uh, the regulatory agencies could measure the impact on fatality rates and show the benefit of this regulation in sort of objective, indisputable terms. 
And I think, you know, because regulation in many cases ends up being kind of a nuclear option, right? It's written by lawyers, negotiated by lawyers, enforced by lawyers, it becomes fuzzy, it may not always do what you want it to do. So unless you have that kind of feedback loop and you can measure the outcome and you can see that it's actually getting you the benefit that you intended it to get, it's very dangerous to unleash it without that closed loop of being able to measure the benefit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So there's obviously a huge number of topics uh, raised here. I'm interested in the question of regulatory failures. In particular, in the United States, there's one cloud company which is not allowed to sell its personal data. That company is Netflix. All the other companies don't have these statutory regulations. Uh, there's a history behind this particular regulation on video rentals. And likewise, in reg with the financial industry, we've seen how the Financial Industry Standards Committee has been used to put backdoors in, widely, in crypto systems that luckily weren't widely deployed, but it did in fact happen that X, the X9 committee was instrumental in bringing dual EC into the standards. Um, and also with regulation, I think there's a third sort of question, which is, we talk about, it seems like you're talking about regulation, in the sense that there's an agency that makes rules and you have to comply with the rules. Well, there's another kind of regulation, particularly in the United States, and that's tort where if the car company makes a car and the car is defective and it crashes, you sue them. And that's, that's different from what the National Highway Safety Administration does. So would you like to comment on any of the things I've just listed? Wow. I, 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 I can, to give other people time to think, I can um, sort of pose a hypothetical problem about the cars. Axel knows this one. So, um, so self-driving cars. So, so, so let's let's say deliver, they deliver on the safety promise, right? Uh, but you know, there's a huge attack surface. Obviously, it's connected. You know, lots of software, lots of computers. So, but as I said, let's say they deliver on the safety promise, and the number of fatalities, and I think the number of uh, driving fatalities in U.S. right now is like 30,000 a year or something like that. So let's say it goes down to 10,000. So 20,000 lives a year saved. Uh, but then somebody hacks a car remotely, and four people or even a hundred people, let's say, die from those hacks. Is that like a, a horrible disaster and we should not have allowed those cars in the road or is that a huge win and we should have released them even sooner? That's exactly why I prefer tort to regulation because the regulator has an incentive to prevent this, whereas tort law, the liability is spread. The 30,000 accidents, some of them are uncaused human error. Those will, you know, people will, re but auto insurance companies will say, hey, if you drive a self-driving car, we're lowering your rates, and manufacturers can charge more for that. So I think getting the economics right, and tort is decent at that, it's not perfect, is probably more important than positive regulation, where I think there's incentive to react politically. Yeah, I think there is like two ends of the spectrum when uh, making software. And you know, on the one end of the spectrum, you're probably on the one end of the spectrum where software is written but not rigorously proven to perform the task that was supposed to. And then there is like the way that NASA writes the software to control the shuttle. And you know, those are probably like the, the two reasonable ends of the spectrum. And you know, the, the industry at large, technology and services industry, everybody has decided that they'd rather prefer writing software fast versus taking years to make small changes. And I think it's an interesting balance because who knows, maybe like if you think a very long horizon in a hundred years time, you, you would have been better off trying to write things very, very slowly and very carefully. But the reality is also that if you write things faster, you can experiment more and you can see what works and what doesn't. We probably wouldn't have an iPhone if we had written every piece of software since the 50s as with the same amount of care that NASA takes to write the shuttle software. So I, I think it's, a, you know, there is a fundamental technology, te technology of China. And perhaps we solve this with res research, which is like provable frameworks where everything is just like comes to you and you don't have to like spend years and years and years making sure that the software is correct. It's sort of like, you code it, there are some checks that can be statically or like dynamically done, and you have a higher level of assurance. 
So I think bringing back a little bit the discussion on the technical side, I think clearly the industry has been doing a lot of work pushing more on the safety of the things that we use to write software. So, you know, C++ has become a much safer language than it used to be. Uh, the libraries that we use have safe defaults that are built so that even the people that don't understand the cryptography or like the, the, the reasoning behind them can safely use them because they're the easiest thing to use and they're the safest thing to use. So I think, you know, from like a technological point of view, some of, there is like, there is no tension in a sense. There is like a third choice. There is it's not like, uh, there isn't in a, a dichotomy. It's, there is a third choice, which is trying to work on technologies that are safer by default and they're simpler to use for a wide range of engineers out there that don't need to understand the deep security implications behind them. I think we, we tend to see the, anything that happened in the past as linear and easy. So we were talking about uh, security um, and safety in bridges before, or uh, cars. And we think that someone came up with the idea of a car and the engine. And then overnight, someone thought, well, actually, we might need um, speed limitations and roads and zebra crossings and red lights and seat belts. But that wasn't like that. We have all this because there was a long process of social negotiation of where the limits should be and what the regulation should look like. And mistakes were made in that, in that process. But also some things were done that have lasted a long, long time, but it's only recently that we have airbags. So new things are come up and then they become new additions that become the new standard. But these are long processes in which lots of people screw up. The industry, the regulator, the startups and the companies that provide the solutions. It's just, it takes time for us to agree that this is a decent enough solution for a new technology, be it bridges or cars. And I think we're in the middle of the same debate for many of the technologies that we are developing. But that's why my, my argument is we need to have this debate. Um, the decision cannot be made only by the engineer or the company or the government because we tend to screw up when we work on our own. If we work together, we can have better diagnosis of what the problems are and what people expect from us, and then our technologies will be a lot more successful because of, because of this. And, and don't, do not get me wrong, I think that the future of privacy resides in privacy-enhancing technologies, not the government. And I think that the future of security resides in crypto solutions, not the government. But the government can help in, in understanding and identifying when collective problems and collective rights are being abused by those that don't play by the rules or by, or by those that minimize the impact of their devices on the rights of people. But, but this debate has to be rooted in hard data, right? N not just anecdotal references to sort of to, to, public, to well publicized cases, but in actual hard data, right? So when we talk about the safety regulations, once again, you're right, those evolved over time and through a long dialogue, but also based on real uh, sort of fatality data, right? And we don't have much in terms of that in sort of in computer security these days, right? Um, That's so. why an insurance company for data would be a good idea, because you'd put a price tag to that data breach or a privacy loss. But we definitely, we, we, we like that. So what, what is the cost of a privacy breach? How much is my privacy cost? And, and, and many people in my community are against this debate because they yes. think well, you cannot monitize well, a fundamental right. But well, listen, if the, you know, the, the, someone that's dying the on the- That's the EU versus America debate, right? So in America, <laughs> you have to show real harm. In the EU, it, yeah, sort of, it, it's a fundamental right. So. so there are no more further questions from the audience. I'm really surprised. I mean. Okay. So maybe, I mean, uh, I really enjoyed the discussion so far, and I think we touched a lot of uh, strategic um, dimensions and epic problems that we need to solve. Uh, maybe we can get, maybe we can get to try to, to get it a bit more concrete. For example, the hardware versus software trade-off. I guess that could be interesting for the audience. So uh, I, I like the point that you made about <clears throat> some devices are only two years in the field, so you can put it in hardware and then throw it out. Like, Smart cards, they're like three, five years in the field, and then you throw it out. But in the long run, you need software. So how do we get software more secure? We have hardware virtualization, like trust zones, yes, but then people come up with all kind of fancy new attacks, flip feng shui, row hammer, cache timing attacks in the clouds, these kind of things. So, and then again, attackers are always ahead of the engineers. Engineers luckily react rather quickly 
compared to politicians. <laughs> so that's another question. How do we make politicians decide faster and then train judges <laughs> to, to, to act on that law? But maybe we should focus here more on the engineering challenges. So do you have any thoughts on what could help in hardware to make secure software more secure? Do we need that? Is it possible? Can we just do everything in software, white box and so on? Or do we, is there still place for some hardware anchor? I, I, that's a broad question. I, I, th I think that there are lots of challenges. There are things where, uh, there are areas where hardware could help. There are areas where hardware crypto may not help that much. Like, you know, if we look at the, uh, uh, you know, the car hacks from Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek for the last few years, I'm not sure how crypto would have helped with any of that, um, or maybe even hardware uh, roots of trust or anything like that. Uh, so a lot of what we need to do on software is kind of just mundane, secure development lifecycle, um, uh, stuff that takes time and effort. Um, at the same time, um, kind of the most fundamental software problem of, uh, of uh, stack-based buffer overflow you know, you can say that it's a hardware failing, but we don't have, that hardware doesn't provide us with an abstraction to call a function and return to a place where it's supposed to return, right? Um, um, the, I'm, I'm gonna interpret the question really broadly and, <laughs> and then uh, touch a broader uh, software subject. I think, well, t two points. So one, uh, you know, we talked about being able to patch software, I think, that will remain actually a big challenge. Um, and the challenge is not going to be, you know, getting the bits in a secure way to the device. Th that, that's a simple engineering problem. We know how to do that. Uh, the challenge is going to be getting the patch in the first place, right? And that ties back to the business models, right? Because maintaining software and developing patches costs money, right? So business models need to evolve that provide that continuous revenue stream to you know, to the vendors of the product to keep producing the patches, especially if it's in the field like automotive where it's gonna be in the, f you know, where it's gonna be in the field for 20 years. Well, yeah, sort of 10, 20 years. And so, you know, that's a lot of uh, engineering time and effort, supply patching. Um, I guess one more quick point I would like to make, I think reverse engineering is gonna get increasingly important. I think systems are getting remarkably complex um, and um, a lot of times, um, like complex where they're sort of uh, bordering complexity of, you know, natural or biological systems, right? And the only way you can really study systems this complex is uh, to kind of, you know, to, to, to treat them as a black box system, form a hypothesis and test it, which is, you know, kind of how science works, right? How you study the natural world, how we, uh, and that's how we discover more and more things um, I think about you know man-made systems these ways uh, these days. We rely more and more on reverse engineering, and I see reverse engineering really becoming um, a much bigger part of our um, of actually of the academic field in this industry. Both hardware and software, right? Yes, both hardware and software. So picking up on that, you know, you mentioned the JPAC and patching. So I think it's I want to tie it all to like hardware and software, and like the things I was saying before about like secure defaults. So I think part of the kill chain of getting like full control of the canvas was an insecure firmware update on like one of the chips in the chain, right? So this is my understanding of it. That was that was that was the bug they used, but they said that it, that wasn't there. Like there was right, right. a range <laughs> of other ones available to them. Sure, sure. That didn't require but, like, overriding let's the use firmware. That as, a, yeah. as an example. So that was part of the kill chain, and why was the manufacturer left to design a secure firmware update protocol. You know, like these things should be designed once by the chip maker and done right. And you, you need to like be able to like plug a key and like do it. Yeah, Everybody's the, problem is, the problem is there's 12 chip makers in the car. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. And like maybe like you, you update each one of them using their protocol that gets designed once mm -hmm. and right. But like, why do you leave it to the car manufacturer? It, but it wasn't the car manufacturer, right? It was the, I don't even remember if it was a tier one or tier it two manufacturer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I guess, I guess the, the point is like, can we like make sure that these technologies can be just, they're done right once and you know. 
Uh, yeah, I, I think we can, but I, I would, again, like to stress, I think that's the easy part of the problem. I think so, so solving the secure update is easy. It's getting the updates that will actually be continuously pushed and sort of getting them through the supply chain. That's going to be the challenge for the next decade. Well, there's there's going to be IT systems in the automotive or the ve vehicular in the transportation industry that haven't existed before, specific to cybersecurity in a lot of ways. But uh, the the issue that is always going to be there is that. There's no silver bullet. Everybody knows that every system's got a weakness. So the solution that you're going to have in vehicles is a layered approach. You're going to have a layer of authentication. You're going to have a layer of encryption, at least one. You're going to have asymmetric key generation. You're going to have symmetric key exchange. You're going to have lots of different layers put in there, including an IPS system to provide a feedback loop to improve your cyber system. Um, so you know it's about layers. and, and the more layers you have, the more complexity you add. But if you do it in software, you can you can engineer or architect out a lot of that so that complexity that you can't architect out with hardware. I think there is also there's also a good point in the sense that um, I was you know, and I encourage everybody to to see the presentation at Usenix of the uh, NSA DAO chief. He was describing. Their offensive techniques of how they get into other people's networks. You know, very, very interesting talk. And one of the points that he brought up was that reputation should be used more. So, even in, I think, potentially even low level systems. So, for example, you know, when a hack happens, like you're probably going to try to exfiltrate data or getting commands from outside. It's a hard problem to try to whitelist all the sources that can send you commands, but you can have some centralized source that says, well, I have seen commands from these different 10 sources, and now all of a sudden I'm getting a command from this one new source that nobody else, no other car like this has got commands from. You know, what's going on? Like, why, why am I getting an update from like some completely new uh, IP address or you know, host that has no reputation whatsoever. I thought that that was an interesting vehicle of assurance because it's basically like offloading uh, the problem of security on, and, and, ma and making it become a problem of reputation, which I think it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting way of going by. Just maybe to build on this. The the technical challenge for us, the main technical challenge from the point of view of privacy and ethical impacts of technology is anonymization. How do we make sure that if hacks are going to happen, um, information is going to be hacked? And I only work with data, data intensive technologies, technologies that are intensive in the use of personal data. So there's other hacks for it that are looking for money and things like this. I'm, I don't work on this. But if systems are going to be hacked and hackers are going to have access to data, then how do we make sure that that data cannot lead to the re-identification? of the individuals? How do we anonymize the data? How do we make sure that the data that we input into our systems can never um, recreate a physical person with their name and their address and their sexual preferences and their medical data? And that's a huge challenge for us. And the EU is making a big effort in that respect, at least in terms of um, regulating around this. So there's, a, there's a position piece from Article 29 on anonymization that talks about differential privacy, attribute-based encryption, and these are supposed to become the standards of the new era. However, we have some mechanisms and some, some techniques that work, but because solutions are always concrete, we still lack many more um, techniques and methodologies. So developing these anonymization techniques and designing anonymization methods for specific technologies in different fields is a very clear challenge for us. Okay, in view of time, um, I'd like to have each and everybody give me one final answer. In Port's talk, we heard that he believes in three to five years it's going to be worse, but then there's hope that in 10 years it might be even better than now, security and privacy-wise. I'd like to get your simple answer, better or worse. So how do you see the security and privacy situation will be in 10 years from now? Better or worse? I think it's going to be better. I, um, 
I always say, at, at Eticus, I started Eticus three years ago, I left university, and I thought it was gonna be just a thing for myself, you know, I'd be able to employ a couple more people. Three years later, there's, um, there's 50 people working in 10 countries on these issues. And I often say that in our field, we don't need to do any commercial activities, we just need to sit back and wait for privacy disasters to happen. And then every time there's a data breach. Thanks to the engineers, and, right. And, uh, and yeah, and, and, and personal data gets out there, the phone rings. And it might be um, uh, a municipality hearing that London had to remove the spy bins after um, uh, a newspaper picked on the amount of information they got from people's mobile phones and they call us and be like, can you please help me make sure that the same thing that happened to London doesn't happen to me? When New York had to remove the beacon-based um, systems on phone booths, the same thing happened. So every time there's a privacy disaster, the phone rings. And luckily for us, I guess, these happen daily. And I think that in the field of security, that's, that's pretty much the same. There's gonna be more and more awareness that is gonna be led not by governments, not by regulation, not by the industry, but by people realizing that this brand new world of data has its downsides and therefore demanding um, solutions, answers, and alternatives. And I cannot highlight this enough. We need alternatives. We can't keep telling people, you need to become an engineer in order to protect your privacy or protect your data. People need to have solutions, alternatives. We need standards that are um, less privacy um, invasive. And we see a huge market failure here. There are not enough engineers working on privacy enhancing technology and the market for this is just huge. Okay, that's one nil for better. So I'd like to have Daniels. I'm an optimist, so I'm gonna say better. <laughs> and I think it's because if you look at, you know, Windows 10, it's way more secure under any single metric than Windows 95 was. And I think one hypothesis you need to have in order to think that things are gonna get worse is that there is an infinite supply of categories of attacks. So, you know, there's mashing the stack and there's return-oriented programming on like, you know, and then you can get incredibly sophisticated and then, you know, you, you have row hammer that, you know, challenges everything you thought about memory and like boundaries but like, is there an infinite supply of these things? And I don't think there is. Like at some point we're gonna like have to run out of, of them and we will have. We will never understand how computers work. <laughs> no, but like, never. yeah, but it'll, it'll, it'll become a trickle though. Like right now it's, it's like we're discovering this whole new thing. Uh, and I hope that there isn't an infinite, I, I mean, I'm an optimist. So I hope that there isn't an infinite supply of this. Like, 50 years from now, somebody will not come up with something as insanely clever as Rohammer, hopefully. Or if they do, it is gonna be a much more rare thing. And it's just something that just happens every year. So I hope things will get better. Okay, that's two nil. Oh, David. Yeah, well, my answer on both sides. For people in the cybersecurity business, especially in, in Embedded, 10 years from now, you're gonna be looking at a a hundred billion dollar a year business that today is in less than ten billion dollar a year business. So from a business perspective, things are looking up. Um, <laughs> from a chaos perspective, I mean, we talk a lot about Windows and, and Linux and, and all the solutions that exist to protect servers and workstations and desktops and notebooks. But when you get down to a, a, an M0 plus or a 16-bit microcontroller, you don't have any of the security that's available today in, in, the, in the mainstream. And most of the devices that we're gonna be interacting with and they're gonna be actuating in our lives are gonna be low performance devices with no OS, if, if, if an RTOS at all. And so that's gonna make for an enormous amount of chaos opportunity for the people in this room. So that's the worst? Worse and better. <laughs> <laughs> Business perspective, pick one. better. Pick one. Okay, worse then, okay. <laughs> Alex? So, um, so I, I'm an optimist too, but maybe I define the term slightly different, right, differently. Uh, you know, a pessimist is somebody that thinks that uh, things can't possibly get any worse, and an optimist knows that they can get much, much worse. Uh, so <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I, I think up until maybe uh, a year or maybe a few months ago, I would have said better, but I'm really, I, I'm still not quite sure how to internalize like the Sony pictures and the DNC hacks. Um, if sort of if the attribution stories are to be believed and this is really um, kind of 
you know, civilian collateral damage from uh, nation state attacks, then it's a very troubling kind of development. And it, it, it's not really something that we've seen before, and it may kind of evolve our thinking in very new and different ways. So I, I would have to, like right now, I'm worried that it will get worse. All right. So if you draw, then I'm here to decide. <laughs> uh, I think it's going to get the next couple of years much worse and much, much, much worse. But I'm also an optimist, and I believe in 10 years we will have solved it. Or at least it's starting to get better. Security level is definitely higher. Or but retired. <laughs> and then, but then the big question is, um, how do we make that happen? And what should we be looking on research-wise to, to do that? And I took a couple of notes during the uh, discussion. I think one of the most pressing issues is how do we get security out efficiently and fast and quickly. Um, then provable frameworks for secure coding, not a great code would help. So that's a good PhD topic, I guess. Then we have software patching, but they're more on the business side. So maybe a PhD in business uh, or economics uh, could help here. Reverse engineering, hardware software, driving the boundaries there um, helps. Um, then I think really a big challenge, and that's probably an interdisciplinary uh, approach as well, is how do we measure security and the impact of breaches? And there we need policies and things involved. And finally, how do we make politicians decide faster and train judges and sociologists and everybody else? So I'd like to thank everybody here for the participation. And in, in particular, I'd really like to thank uh, the panelists for everybody coming here. And i really like you to join me in giving them all a... Big round of applause.